Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murphy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. As you've probably noticed, we're on location today in Lambeth Palace in a very grand room because our guest this week is Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, thank you very much indeed for doing this. Now, you're our guest because you've written a new book called The Power of Reconciliation. Yes. Which is obviously very timely given war, culture war, personal conflict. Yes. I mean, what, what is reconciliation, first of all? Reconciliation is the transformation of destructive forms of conflict into being able to disagree well. So it's not about agreement or fliffy, floffy, wishy-washy compromise. It is changing a conversion of the forms of disagreement so that the disagreement may well remain. In fact, in most cases, it normally does. But it is not carried on destructively and certainly not violently. So why is reconciliation preferable to winning? Uh, because nobody ever wins, or very seldom. There are extraordinary exceptions in history where one side wins. For instance, 1945, which was an epoch-changing moment in, our, in history in Europe. But, on the whole, wars and conflicts and personal conflicts, for instance, in a family. I can't imagine, probably in your family, you ever have an argument. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but when you do, is the aim to win, or do you realise, after a while of trying to win, that this is a jolly silly way of spending time, and you actually need to find a way, and even if you go on disagreeing, you disagree, but you affirm your love to one another. But perhaps it's only in families where most of us realise that, isn't it? And, yeah. actu and actually, in, in, in many of the conflicts that we are drawn into, whether it's culture war arguments on social media or, or national arguments, whether it's Brexit or Ukraine or all of those kinds of things, the parties in those conflicts tend to believe that they will win the argument eventually. But in an election, you may win the vote, but you don't necessarily win the argument. And there's a very, very big difference because after an election or a referendum like Brexit, there's a decisive decision made and we go a particular way. But then actually the reconciliation process is about saying you're not the enemy because you take a different view from me. Uh, you're a human being who takes a different view from me and we, we will seek to find a way forward in which we can disagree well and yet ma maintain our unity as a nation, as a family, and it happens within the individual. I mean, you know, we have the sort of interior conflicts within ourselves. Uh, reconciliation with oneself, with who I am and what, what I'm about, what my skills and failures are, and that's a very key part of growing up as a human being. You, you have seen reconciliation or attempts to reconcile international parties. Yes. Um, can you give me an example of where it's worked? <laughs> Sadly, not many. Um, but I can in one particular case. I was working in Nigeria in uh, a state called Plateau State. And there was really violent conflict, several thousand people being killed. And I remember we, the first trip there and driving through uh, for a couple of hours through countryside where the only people you saw were armed groups. And um, there was, all the villages were burnt out. And it was, it was very, very bad. And it wasn't a religious-based conflict. It was much more complicated than that. One of the things about this book is that in conflict, you have to embrace complexity. Do not simplify. Because when you simplify, you forget things that, to the people in the conflict, are intensely important. That's true of everything, isn't it? <laughs> it's, yeah, it is. And it's one of your problems, because you've somehow got to condense it down to an hour five times a week or whatever. But in that case we uh, started three or four processes. We found leaders in each community and equipped them in those days with sat phones so that they could talk to the leader of the other community when they saw the young men going off with their guns. We had to find a way of, of the reintegration of refugees. There'd been a large number of refugees. Some work was done with the police on training on de-escalating conflict. And for many years after that, there was, uh, it was quite peaceful. Um, 
and uh, then other things happened and uh, other groups came in, Boko Haram, from outside and inspired a further revival of conflict. And the failure in that case was it wasn't, it was only middle out and bottom up. And what was needed as well was top down with uh, a better security situation. What, what is the leap of faith that is required? Or maybe, maybe faith is the wrong word, but what is the leap of imagination that is required to get people to do it? Is it accepting that you won't win or...? Yes. I mean, you can't... While one side thinks they're going to win, there will not be reconciliation. And first, the other point to make, of course, is that reconciliation is made by the parties. Outsiders can just catalyse and help and support in, in certain ways. But if one side thinks they're going to win, you're wasting your time. The key moment is when both sides begin to think there is going to be no end to this. This is not a tolerable way of spending my life. I want this to stop. But I don't want it to stop at the cost of surrender. And so they will fight grimly on. And at that point, if there is the opportunity to enable them to imagine a different future, then, you can, then they will make progress on reconciliation. Do you think there can be just conflict where your role as a, as a religious leader is to say, fight until you win? I think there can be conflicts where you have to recognise um, that until a particular group has been captured or otherwise removed from the scene, there will not be peace. And one of the difficult things about reconciliation is one of those words that sounds very fluffy, but it's not fluffy. You have to have a really clear-eyed view and you have to identify who are the spoilers, the people who have a vested interest in the conflict continuing, might be arms suppliers. In a family dispute, and I do a lot in there about families, in a family dispute, um, you might find that there is you know, a particular person who is trying to stir up the conflict, a third party, because they, they see some advantage to themselves. Um, but yes, occasionally in an armed conflict, and I can remember one particular one, where um, talking to the security people involved, um, not in Africa, we said, unless if this group and this leader are still around, you're not going to get that. I mean, I, I ask because the, the Russian Orthodox Church is in deep controversy at the moment mm. because it's backing the war in Ukraine. Is, is that an appropriate role for a church? The role of the church in a conflict like that that is to call for peace. The church has to follow Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who says in the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. There's nothing new about this. And I think the need to call for peace is absolutely a priority. And a lot of members of the Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, are doing that. Does it concern you that religion is being misused there? I mean, you know, I'm thinking of the images of Putin in church at Easter. And... Yeah, it does. Um, of course, we have to remember that, it's, you know, it's easy to say them, but we look at, um, you go back in this country and other countries, in wars the church always gets, um, or faiths, always get mobilised. It's not just Christians, but other faiths get mobilised. It's a way of mobilising people very powerfully. Uh, but for me, one of the great... There are so many tragedies in, in, in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Um, the biggest of all is the huge loss of human life and the destruction of the Donbass and other areas, the vast suffering of the, of the Ukrainian people but also that it's a totally unnecessary and evil war and uh, a war of choice and the need for the church there to be saying peace 
that gives security that enables Ukraine to stand firmly as an independent country. These are things that, that can be done. In a family conflict, mm. if you want to reconcile a family conflict, mm. how do you begin? You be begin by seeing whether the family want to be reconciled. Um, if there's a willingness to consider this as a way forward. And then you um, spend a lot of time listening because you have to listen your way into the shoes of the people who are in the conflict. What's stirring their hearts and their minds? What's making them do self-destructive and entirely irrational things? Uh, which might involve, for instance, spending fortunes on legal fees and damaging their own souls in the way they do that. How do you do that is by being with them, by being present, by being curious. The last section of the book is about the habits of reconciliation. You have to be present with people. You have to, you have to sit and absorb some of the pain that's going on and, so that it's part of you. You have to be curious. You have to know hear what, how they see the world, and then there's the process of enabling them to reimagine. What about blame? I mean, taking blame out? There will be a point where, if there is blame, that people can hear that. But it's not right at the beginning. It's the same or similar question, parallel question, to the question of justice. Winner's justice is seldom justice. Justice and blame and taking responsibility and apology and repentance and turning away from destructive behaviour are points that come as people get enough confidence to do them without feeling they're going to be taken advantage of. So it's a very iterative process that, that, that goes along bit by bit. Um, and where is, where is religion in this process? Where is God for you in this process? Uh, at the very heart of the process, the heart of what it is to be a Christian is to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ and to be part of the global church, which at its best is one of the great agents of reconciliation in which it takes a holistic view of the whole human being, body, mind and spirit, and enables the whole human being or group of people to find that they can change their circumstances, they can change their context, they can change their thinking. Um, reconciliation is, in one sense, to use a religious word, a conversion process. It's a conversion from destructive forms of conflict to uh, disagreeing well. Is that a conversion process that you went through yourself as a Christian? It's one that I still go through myself. You still, it's a constant process. It's a, the, the, the idea, I remember, Years and years ago, after the um, Good Friday Agreement, about three weeks later, listening to a programme of some kind or watching a programme of some kind, an interview, and one of the principal people in the Good Friday Agreement was asked, so has reconciliation been achieved? And this person being interviewed just sort of looked uh, and you could see them thinking, what world are you living in? We've been fighting for 30 years. You know, it, reconciliation is a generational process. Have, when were we reconciled with the Germans after 1945? I think we probably, it's always a journey, but I think we're probably 99.9% you know, .9 there in most cases. But it takes generations, doesn't it? Um, I remember my father would never buy a, a German car. He died many, many years ago. But, um, uh, and it's, it's, in a family, even a minor argument leaves a faint feeling for a while and then it dies away. A major conflict. Um, I still hear, you know, you will hear families who'll say, well, no, we haven't spoken to so-and-so because their father did X. Uh, it's really difficult. Um, I mean, in terms of conflict or arguments, you know, there are people who are saying, well, Justin Welby seems to be inserting himself into arguments at the moment. 
you know, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, just on Twitter, Zach Goldsmith, the Tory Lord, has been furious about what you tweeted in response to the Sue Gray report. Oh, is he? Oh, well, um, there we are. I just wonder what you, th- you know, first of all, why, why, did, why did you feel the need to insert yourself into that argument? I'm not sure it's inserting myself. I mean, it's part of the job, isn't it? You know, that there's a very strong moral component, an ethical component to the discussion. Um, it's not inserting itself. It's, it's part of living in a society of free speech. Maybe. That's your job, is it? It's That's part true. of the job. Uh, the main job, I mean, the job is to speak of Christ and of Christ crucified and risen and ascended and to lead the church in worship and witness. But part of the witness process is taking an active interest in what is happening in our society and not being um, totally pietistic about it and say we're going to just be in our holy huddle. Because we're part of society. The church is a part of society, as Zach Goldsmith is. He's perfectly entitled to have a go at me, and that's fine. What, what, what was the main point that you were making in response to that, the about, main... about the quality of public life? The main point that I was making, and it was carefully not personalised, is let's look forward and say whatever happens with the Prime Minister or political figures is a matter for politicians. So it wasn't commenting on that in any way at all. Uh, what it was saying is what the Sue Gray re- one of the things Sue Gray report shows us is the need for a renewal of the default reactions within inst- our institutions, um, so that the default reaction when someone says, you know, uh, the rules are X but we'll do Y, is to say, oh, it'd be lovely to do it, but it's not a good idea because the rules are X, and that. I think Sue Gray points to that really well. It's a, it's a cultural issue, and cultural issues need changing so institutions can be renewed. So it's a systemic it's problem? A, it's, it's, it is a systemic problem. Yes, it's a systemic problem in many institutions, including the Church of England. Because a lot of people at the moment just think it's about, it is about individuals rather than the system. You know, it's, it's, about, it's about one individual in particular, Boris Johnson. That's a political question. I'm not yeah. going there. But I think it is very, very much about um, the system that a good institution has biases in it towards doing the right thing. But... It will vary what you do from circumstance to circumstance, but you will still, it will, the system will say, through people having a gut feel, we don't do things that way and we do do things that way. So what's your message about reconciliation then with, with the culture wars that we are now gripped by, which have followed Brexit, I suppose, and have kind of followed the arc of Trump and the arguments around immigration... Uh, gender, trans, all of these things around which, you know, we, we are divided, you know, on, as a society and on social media and within our politics. Is there reconciliation in all of that? The culture wars seem to me to be, to a large extent, an effort to turn into a simple binary things that are incredibly complex. And because it's easier to do it that way. And reconciliation starts with saying, it isn't as simple as that. It's more complicated. And the culture wars are the sense we can win. You know, if we fight hard enough, we can win going this way or that way. We're never going to win those. It's much too complicated for anyone to win. All it will do is leave all groups deeply dissatisfied because they haven't quite won. So reconciliation in that is finding ways of embracing the complexity and uh, resetting the boundaries of what is acceptable in the way we deal with each other. So how, how can we reconcile, for example, the trans argument? Um, the honest answer is I don't know at the moment. I think part of what we're trying to do in the church as we look at our own at, um, policies on sexuality and, and so on, and identity particularly is to say, how do we reconcile? First of all, we say that every human being is of equal dignity and worth. Second, we say, having said that, the way we treat each other has to reflect that sense of intrinsic 
dignity and worth. And that means deciding what are absolute essentials and um, the things we really, really disagree about and learning to love one another with our differences, to care for one another, to disagree well. And I think that's the big challenge. You see, you, and I do myself, so I'm not criticising, you use the phrase the trans issue. Uh, It's trans people, and when we turn it into an issue, it becomes something over which we fight. When we remember this is about human beings with all their complexities then they become one of our neighbours who must be loved in the way we love ourselves. Does that also mean you then have to accept that some people have more rights than others? Is that part of the, the compromise, the reconciliation? You know, because that, that's where this argument gets difficult, isn't it? Reconciliation is very seldom a compromise. That might be part of a settlement. But reconciliation, as I say, is about the transformation of destructive ways of, of disagreeing to disagreeing well. So I think one of the steps is that you don't treat those who disagree with you as your enemy. You treat them as human beings of value who disagree with you. And you seek to understand what they're saying and why it's so important. And um, some people have more rights than others. I think some people in... I'm not talking about... Uh, trans people necessarily I'm not clear enough on that but in all circumstances there are people who for a while will have more rights than others particularly if they've been very ill-treated in the past I mean issues around race issues around abuse part of reconciliation is to show that the people who have suffered are treated as precious yes I I suppose what I'm getting at is that there is a tension between saying equal value, equal love, equal respect, and yet not being able to do the same things, whether that's gay marriage within the church or um, you know, the rights of trans people to, to, yes. to, to recognise their own gender, all of those sorts of things. Part of that is avoiding the phrase which comes out of the apartheid era of equal but different which can often be a cover for intense hypocrisy. But isn't that where you're heading with a lot of these issues? That people will be equal but different? Yes, but I'm not going to treat it as a virtue. I want to unpack that and say, well, what exactly do we mean by that? Uh, Does that mean equal but I've more rights than they have? Or equal but I'm in a stronger position than they have? One of the key things about reconciliation is it it involves sacrifice, particularly by the stronger party, because the pattern of reconciliation is that of God who gives his only son so that the world may be saved, to misquote John chapter 3, verse 16, and so that we do need to accept that there will be costs and sacrifices in a process of reconciliation. Um, But it... Equal but different, I'm quite cautious about, because it's so easy for that just to cover hypocrisy. Can we, can we rewind and sort of talk a little bit about your own journey? Uh, and I'm going to ask you some quite simple questions, because I think oh, you sometimes be, have That would be a to. very welcome change. Uh, well, I mean, because I want to work out, first of all, what it is you believe and how you got there. So when, when did you decide that you believed in God and... Christianity and Jesus? 1975. You know precisely. As it happens in my case, people drift into it. Others, it's a clear moment. For me, it was a clear moment. What happened? Uh, I uh, was with a friend in Cambridge. Um, I was at Cambridge at the time, and uh, uh, he, we'd been talking all evening about meanings of life and faith and all that sort of stuff. And he explained to me how um, he explained to me the, the, about the crucifixion and the person of Jesus as fully God and fully human. And I didn't really know, but it made sort of sense. Something spoke to me very deeply. And at the end of the evening, I prayed quietly and said, um, 
uh, God, I don't even know if you exist, but if you're there, and this is true, I want you to, I, I want to be in your hands. So when did you discover that God did exist? Well, more or less instantly. <laughs> there was a huge sense of, uh, at the time, of, a, of the presence of God, and in a way, a sense of change, inner change and, and of renewal. And what, what, what do you believe God is? Well, I think if, uh, I believe God looks rather like Jesus, because that's the whole aim. Jesus is the image of God. In looking at Jesus, you see who God is. And uh, what God is, we will discover over eternity with great joy. But it's rather, uh, by definition, God is, I mean, you can, you can quote Anselm and you can, you know, that than which there is no greater and all that kind of thing. And you can do um, all kinds of arguments for the existence of God. For me, the key to who I understand God to be is who God has revealed himself to be through the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And is God all powerful? I mean, when you say you pray to God for things or for people, do you believe God directly affects those things? I believe that God is all powerful and wise and perfectly loving and that we live in a world that's a very complicated mess and I, as much as anyone else, will want certain things, but God is in his love, gives us space for things to go wrong. You, you were part of the, I was a quite famous church in, in Brompton. Holy Trinity, Brompton. Holy Trinity. Did you do the Alpha course there? No, it was, I, we, we were there before the Alpha course. Before the Alpha, you, no, you were the so precursors. Old. Right. So, so can you explain what, the what, is, that, Old Testament what is that Trinity. role, if you like, or what is that version of... Christianity, because it's, it's described as evangelical or charismatic. Well, I do know, I, well, you can, these labels are incredibly unhelpful. What the Alpha Course is, is a series of basically questions, as they, the ads say, questions for life, a talk which at its best should present the traditional, commonly accepted view of the key questions around um, Christian faith, who is God and why did Jesus die and so on and so forth. And then issues about ethics and behaviour over, over 10 weeks, 10 evenings. And the most important bit is that once the talk's been done and you have some nice food or cake or something, cake has a very high theology in Alpha, uh, at least when I was doing it, um, uh, and leading it in my parish and other places. Uh, and then small groups, about six, seven, eight people, who, if it's being properly led, it, um, the person who's leading each group does not seek to impose solutions or answers. They just let it open to people to say anything they feel like. And they let the other people discuss. And they chew it over. And you give people space to think for themselves rather than tell them what they ought to think. They've heard a proposal and... They can go away and say, I think that's rubbish. Or they can go away and I think, oh, that might make some sense. Um, and I think one of, it's, it's not magic. It's just Alpha is uh, a very good way of enabling people to think clearly through the key things that make us Christians. Because you, you revealed relatively recently, I think, that you, you pray in tongues every day. Well, it wasn't relatively recently. I'd revealed it many, many years you, ago. Okay. But, so what, um, what, so but what does that mean? Quite what right. <laughs> We're doing an alpha course here. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of our listeners sort of will be young, and, and you know, I, I don't like to assume too much knowledge. Praying in tongues uh, for me is a, a form of prayer, very unemotional. Um, it's not ecstatic in any great sense, in, in the commonly used uh, way of ecstatic. Um, and uh, it's praying in, it's allowing the Spirit of God to pray through one in, uh, in the Spirit's words, not in our words. So it's something I don't understand. And to be honest, for me, um, uh, it's part of my discipline of prayer along with 
spending time in silence uh, in the presence of God, uh, along with saying morning prayer and evening prayer and uh, evening prayer in the uh, Book of Common Prayer, um, along with taking communion very regularly. It's just one other aspect of prayer. Is, is that something that came from that church? Or, or was no, it, it wasn't there? actually. It was from somewhere else entirely different. Right. I mean, because the, there is a, there is also perhaps an uncharitable, um, you know, perception of that church, which is in a very affluent part of Britain, um, that it's you know it's rich, successful capitalists making themselves feel better by going to church. Um, well, I think and that... I wonder if there's any element of that in your own history, given no. you were you worked in the oil industry and. No, I don't. I wasn't terribly rich or successful, I have to say. Um, I think, um, no, it's people going to church because they realise that they may look like rich, successful capitalists, but actually, like every other person, they have profound needs. They are sinners. They need God's forgiveness, God's salvation, and God's direction. Um, and that is absolutely at the heart of it. And if you look at the churches that have been planted from Holy Trinity Brompton, where they've set up new congregations, you'll find there's a huge number of them are on very demanding outer estates and areas of extreme poverty. You'll also discover from Holy Trinity, if you look at what they do, um, that they, are, they work more with ex-offenders, they do more in terms of food banks, in terms of caring for those in need uh, than, than probably any other single church, uh, and not just in London, but all over the country. So you, so you, you were, a, I don't know what the phrase is, is it committed Christian or from, from an early... From, from, an from early, 19. But you went into a career. 19. 19. So what, what did you think your life was going to be? I assumed I'd go into the oil industry. Well, I didn't assume I'd go into the oil industry. I got a job in the oil industry because I couldn't get one anywhere else in the, mid seven, uh, in the late 70s. There was a recession going on. And then I sort of assumed that I didn't know what my life would be. I rather hoped. Uh, I, you know, I was sort of ambitious and hardworking and um, hoped I would end up leading, um, having a senior role in a big company. So, so again, what happened? What, what threw you off? I sort of couldn't get away after many years. I was 11 years in that. And I couldn't get away from the... Uh, from quite towards the end of that, I had a very clear sense that God was asking me to offer myself for ordination. What the church did with that was the church's problem. And I was rather hoping they'd turn me down. Um, because I was really enjoying what I was doing. And is it correct that they did, first of all, turn you down? No, really... They didn't quite turn me down. Uh, one group recommended I be turned down. And, and then someone else decided I wasn't going to be turned down. And, and the bishop at the time in the local area said that he'd interviewed more than 1,000 ordinance and I wasn't in the top 1,000, and that I had no future in the Church of England. Uh, how, do, how do you feel at being told there was no future for you in the Church? Well, I was a lay person. I wasn't seeking a future in the church. I was really quite relieved. Oh, really? Yes. Well, because what I felt was I ought to offer myself ordination if the church decided to turn me down. I'd done that. I could right. tick that box and go on and be well paid in the oil industry. Because obviously there's a, there's a current parallel being drawn, I don't know how accurate it is, with Calvin Robinson, the, the um, sort of media figure um, who, yes. who I understand or it is said you intervened on in terms yes. of his ordination is that nope. correct? Absolutely wrong so, so that, did you have any involvement in that? No nope. I didn't even I, I knew he was a candidate but it's entirely not a matter for me. Right. I mean I, I have no right to intervene in that kind of thing it's a matter for his bishop, uh, the Bishop of London and uh, the Bishop of London uh, I'm uh, as a bishop, you are responsible for ordinations in your own diocese. And if I went to Sarah Mullally and said, I think you ought to do X, because she's very polite, she'd say, well, I think that's an interesting idea. But what she'd mean is get out of my diocese and stop interfering, and quite rightly. Um, so, no, I had no involvement in that at all. So as, as time goes on, it's clear that you sort of you listen to the, 
the voice in your head or your heart or wherever it and is. And then check it with others, yes. So do you find your, have you found yourself doing that as Archbishop? Well, that of course. Your role as Archbishop has, you know, has evolves and changes and what you do. As oh, of course. Changes. Absolutely. Um, it changes with circumstances. It changes as you learn, as you realise what idiotic mistakes you made in the past. It constantly changes. And one of the great things here is, the great blessings I have here is being surrounded by a bunch of very bright people and with the bishops. And we do a lot of our decision-making making collectively. Because, again, I, I wonder, whether, are, are you hearing more of a voice to speak out now? I, I, said, I guess partly because of the times we live in. Well, we're going... Crises, we've gone through the most extraordinary series of crises, um, you know, where major, major crises are happening year after year after year, whether it's COVID or whether it's, the, uh, whether it's Ukraine, Russia, uh, whether it's cost of living and this huge spike in inflation and so on and so forth. Uh, the church should be acting, which is what we're doing right across the country with 30-something thousand social projects of caring for people on the edge. That's the key thing we're doing. But you act and speak, and you speak and act. You don't, you know, you don't just let life go by. The church is part of society. Because your, your speech at Easter, which specifically referenced the Rwanda deportation policy, felt like a sort of a big moment. Was it yeah, there? it was. Yeah, it was a big moment. Um, uh, you are absolutely right on that. Uh, there were two bits to that speech. Uh, sermon. <laughs> um, You're using my language. I'm using your language. <laughs> You're infectious, Kristen. Um, it was... It was um, the paragraph before was about the evils of the Ukraine war and, and the appalling suffering. And then on Monday, Thursday, uh, before, which is three days before Easter, one of the holiest days in the year, for Christians, um, there's this announcement about the policy on migrants who are seeking asylum and using illegal routes. And there are no, for most of them, there are no legal routes. So it's quite controversial to say that you know, they're all using illegal routes one way or another. And um, we actually got together on Zoom. I was down in Canterbury and rather busy and talked about this, and I talked with a load of the other bishops. And we felt, as not to demonise the people who, who I think, you know, were, were trying really hard to get this right, but I needed to say something. I remember writing it, it was about six lines, and just wishing I didn't have to. Because it's not, I don't like doing that kind of thing. It's part of the duty of the job, but it's, it's not what you look forward to. What you, the sermon was about the resurrection and then reflecting on what does the resurrection of Jesus mean about how we live today. And not to mention that or to mention uh, the Ru Russia-Ukraine war, not to mention either of those in the context of today or the cost of living crisis, which is also in the sermon, in the context of the resurrection, what does Jesus say to, to his church about how they respond to this? How do we think through these issues in terms of what do I do today, practical application? To have avoided those issues would have been cowardly. And the blowback that you got, was, which was sort of, well, doesn't he care about the people drowning in the boats and all of that? Of course we do. Did it, did it, it didn't cha change your mind in any way? Or, no. no. Of course we do. We're, you know, we're hugely active in Dover and in Calais in seeking for this not to happen, working on the ground. Uh, we work in partnership with... Uh, Canterbury Diocese works in partnership with the Diocese of Arras, uh, with workers on the ground. Uh, supporting people, working as, as aiding those who are in the camps, uh, because that's the last thing you want. So we're ve as the church always is, the reason we speak is we get the best intelligence going because we are absolutely immersed in every community. On a separate matter, but it's related to your own career, which is in oil. In, in oil. Um, which was in oil. Was in oil. <laughs> Well, again, I suppose it's about sort of reconciling past and present. 
yeah. and, and, and the challenge of climate change. Um, the church has a very clear position on net zero. And all it does, that. yes. But are you still investing in fossil fuel companies? And if so, why? Because people say, well, it must be because he was an oil man. I have no influence over the investment policy, quite rightly. Whether we invest in oil companies is handled by an investment committee in the church commissioners, and I have no idea what they do from day to day. Sometimes they inform me, but not always. They lead and formed an enormous group of investors with $30 trillion under management, including um, all kinds of the largest world investors, of which we're a minnow as a church. And uh, they have very clear policies on the oil companies, hydrocarbon companies in which, and mining companies, in which they will invest, and they've disinvested in a very significant number. And they look at the others as to have they clear, measurable, and accessible policies of moving towards net zero, and they will continue to invest provided that's happened. And the policy of the church commissioners, uh, and by organizing this enormous coalition of investors around the world who run something called the Transition Pathway Initiative led by the London School of e helped by the London School of Economics on encouraging the carbon intensive industries towards net zero. So it, it's do you work with people or do you stand outside and shout? Actually we need both. We need the activists and we need the partnerships and we back off um, companies that don't respond. Finally, um, the podcast is Ways to Change the World, and we have an end question, which was always, if you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? I would say that skills, uh, the social skills and the emotional intelligence that leads to reconciliation um, were widely, if I could change the world, I would ensure that they were widely taught and that reconciliation was part of every country's foreign policy um, with trained units working on it, so that the inevitable quarrels and conflicts could be managed without destruction. Archbishop Justin Welby, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Archbishop Justin Welby, thank you very much indeed for sharing your ways to change the world, and thank you for listening. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Freya Pickford. Until next time, bye-bye.